everyone. We're so glad that you joined us today. My name is Alyssa Galea. I'm a staff attorney here at Disability Rights New York, the state's protection and advocacy system for individuals with disabilities. I am a white woman in my early 30s with long brown hair, glasses, and I'm wearing uh, my favorite uh, dark blue shirt with the letters D R N Y um, across the front, and I have a blurred background today. Um, I welcome you on behalf of the entire DRNY team to day four of Never Without Never, pardon me, Never About Us Without Us Emergency Preparedness Webinar Series. Before we begin our panel, our self empowerment and social justice in emergency situations, how people with disabilities can maintain autonomy in disaster session. I am so happy to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Alina Engelman. Associate Professor of the Department of Health at Cal State East Bay. Dr. Engelman, welcome. Please provide the audience with a brief visual description and then we're excited to hear your presentation. Thank you. I could not be more thrilled to be here. I'm a black white woman with long auburn hair and a blue and white Second, short, and I have a right back man, and I have she, her pronoun. Having worked in the emergency preparedness and response field for many years, and that that disabled person, I'm often the only one in the room identifying as such. And now I'm surrounded by disability advocates, doctors, practitioners, as well as dealers and nonprofits working really to elevate the discourse around disability. Really, disability remains really invisible in how government agencies and humanitarian relief nonprofits operate, even though the consequences are great particularly for disabled people of color and other groups that have historically been marginalized and the means of ableism, racism, and other systems of oppression. I want to thank the Disability Rights New York for so tirelessly working to put this conference together and being inspired to push the critical conversation forward. Really, this conference is composed of who's who in the civility, including the that's the risk reduction. And my hope, no, my expectation that our deliberation will elevate outside this room and impact policy at a moment when in a modern environmental crisis for the unique flash that the same community around the world. It's really fitting that today marks the 12th Global Accessibility Awareness Day, the title of the conference, Never About Us Without Us, speaks to the critical principle of self-empowerment as the principle of wish to address using as an example, the focus in my work, the experience of that community in emergency situation. So here a brief overview about a bus to come. I'll be sharing some example of self-empowerment of that in the same community. I really want to emphasize the principle Slowly but surely, awareness is increasing, and initially are happening where disabled people are really being considered in empowered in emergency. And it's very interesting that all of us, whether or not we have it, disability, we are underprepared for an emergency. They did a survey in 2015 Chap by Chapman University found that 86% believe that having an emergency supply kit would improve their 
ability to survive in an emergency. However, 72% of people made no effort to put together a kit. So there's a really disconnect between people's expectation about what happened in an emergency and the reality of the aftermath of an emergency. In that study, the number one excuse for why people didn't prepare it, the way they expect first responders to come to people's aid. This is really an unrealistic belief and probably many disabled people question this belief. This brings me to the key question that I will cover and I wish to pose for anybody watching. How long and how can people with disabilities take leadership in both the emergency preparedness and response space, especially given climate change? By leadership, I mean not just being passing recipient of aid. I mean disabled people have so-called special needs and as a survival mechanism. We have to be involved, we have to be empowered, we have to be proactive in what we can do, can be a model for emergency response for everybody. Really, I believe that emergency preparedness for people with disability must be rooted in community empowerment. Our task today and this week is to examine, learn from critique, support, and expand the kind of initiative I want to hide in. So while the topic of the webinar emphasizes emergency preparedness, I wanted to share a personal story in my own experience and how I came to this orientation in belief in the need for self and community empowerment. I'm going to share an early experience dealing with that community facing a medical crisis that shaped my approach to addressing natural disaster. While I was a graduate student at Yale in 2006, I worked in Kenga doing a new assessment for a program led by and operated by the people addressing the HIV crisis. Uh, the name of the nonprofit was LVCT Health. They had a very unique model for emergency response in a crisis. The better program run by high risk population, sex workers, men who have sex with men, and the deaf community. I witnessed how the grassroots model meant that members of the deaf community were taking on leadership room directing the program, serving as HIV tester, serving as community organizer, serving as educator, accompanying the people to the hospital for treatment. I saw how mobile testing services all over the country in rural areas really made an impact particularly participatory theater. I went to a small that classroom in a small village in the middle of nowhere. So that educator and director from the big city came to this small school in a small town to do an exercise with that middle and high school students, teaching them about how to put on a theater performance about HIV. I believe the solution needs to come 
from the community. That really made the entire foundation of my subsequent work. Really, this model applicable in considering the important question of how disabled people can, through self empowerment, be mobilized to address a crisis that has unique ramifications. I saw the children with limited resources, empowered to get healthcare access, empowered to get their own education about HIV, empowered to openly disclose that they have HIV, and empowered to tackle a medical crisis. The director of the nonprofit at the time, Al Hen, understood the importance of empowering people who are at risk. Sadly, he passed away in a plane crash, but I will never forget his commitment to the foundation and mission of self empowerment for at risk communities. I've written a book chapter about this model, and we can apply it to emergency preparedness with the same people. This was relevant when some years later, in 2012, I worked on a comprehensive emergency preparedness project funded by the CDC at the University of California at Berkeley, addressing the need of deaf and hard of hearing people. We analyzed state, local, and federal emergency operations plans from all 50 states and the territory to see whether or not they even mentioned the term that or disability. We wanted to see if the deaf community was even included. We found that the term that was mostly missing were many state emergency operations plans. As part of that same project, my colleague and I interviewed 14 nonprofits to better understand their capacity to serve their population in an emergency, especially those run by deaf and disabled people. The premise of that whole project assumed, number one, that disabled people knew much about how to meet their own needs in an emergency if given sufficient resources. Of course, the question is whether sufficient resources are available. More recently, in 2022, three colleague and I published a paper which we'll see in the chat in the October 2022 Health Affairs issue on the of justice in climate emergency with an emphasis on mobilizing disabled people as leaders in response efforts. The paper was also featured in a webinar daunting their special issue of disability and health. It's really significant that all authors identified as staff. We looked at case studies spanning the globe in Australia, Kenya, the Philippines, and areas of the global south. We drew particular attention to mutual aid network led by disabled people in adapting the climate related health impact. We then brought up some questions to help policymakers integrate disability doctors into their work. I'm now gonna go ahead and share an example from the US Australia, Lebanon, Kenya, and the Philippines. First, I'll share pieces of what 
the Shiva people are up against. In the Pacific Northwest, he leave a 2021 people with the ship meeting were at a higher risk for adverse health impact, especially for those relying on power and electricity to sustain their lives. Cooling centers are often inaccessible. In the event of a power outage, we all, many of us know that the disabled people are disproportionately poor and thus likely to have access to EC or to have stable homes in neighborhoods that are more geographically protected from the effects of climate change. A New York Times article yesterday said that he will be serving up the weather levels within the next five years. So this issue won't go away. I'm going to share a slide of an example from Australia. Here you see that home during the 2022 flood in northern New South Wales, Australia. The image you see here shows the devastation of the flood. You can see the roofs of home and brown water up to the roof and close the telephone pole. Emergency information was unavailable in multiple formats. Evacuation centers remained inaccessible. There were disruptions to essential services for disabled people involving health, social care, transportation, and food. Disabled people became homeless here. They were more likely to live in areas that were prone to disaster. This example highlights the more reactive approach where support was provided to people affected with disability while it was happening and after, rather than really integrating access needs into community and preparedness services beforehand. I would like to argue here that disabled people and the disability run nonprofit need to embrace self determination. What if disabled people could be the one? to develop accessible solutions and practices that will help them prepare for and respond to future climate emergencies. It will help ensure also the policy of being done for and by them. Now I'm going to share an example from Kenga. In Kenga, Climate change, population growth, settlement in unsafe area, lack of early warning system, and ongoing violent conflicts have exposed disabled people to threats they never seen before. And often, humanitarian responders in the developing area struggle with the novel skill and capacity needed to support the same people. Here you see on the slide, one of the biggest refugee camps in the world, the lab in Kenya. This image showed an aerial view of one of the biggest camps in the world. The ground is thawed and gravel with fishing acting as fencing. 
you can see multiple made of spick with fabric roots. In our health of famous paper, we show one way the same people have become leader and have self-determination in autonomy. In this camp here, you see, they have what they call the civility inclusion in advisory committee operator formed by the same people. They work with refugees living in these camps and accessible assessments, essential services, and making sure that their living arrangements in these camps were accessible. In the coming decade, hundreds of million to run over one Billion people might be displaced due to the consequences of climate change. So we need to have committee like we see here run for and by disabled people. It's really good news that some national and international non-governmental organizations have now adopted this approach. Now I'm gonna share an example from the Philippines. In the Philippines, they had a disability dead coalition of Filipino disabled people, nonprofit that developed a training, a five-day training that could be replicated. A training of the training. They have a manual called the hot handle. And they are done with trainers needed and everybody ready. This manual was tailored to enable the disabled people to engage and train government stakeholders on the civility, including the death, the reduction, plan, policy, and practicing. I love this example from the Philippines. You know, the disabled people are the experts, and here they are showing their expertise in training, trainers. Now I'm going to share another example from Lebanon for how the disabled people can have autonomy and self empowerment. There's a non profit called LASA, the Lebanese. Association for Self Advocacy, appropriately titled, they build a peer support network for Middle Eastern refugees that had intellectual disability in their family. This peer support network enabled them to adapt to life in a different country throughout activity in the co-development of easy to read material. In all the places I mentioned, many of them are those resource settings. They were especially important that disabled people and disabled people organization play a bigger role, especially in the absence of government support. In Puerto Rico, another example, which is me, I wrote a paper about this during the hurricane and the COVID-19 pandemic. The non-profits met critical basic needs. I am... Um, so we 22 organizations with my colleague. 
위스팜 맨막 프로그램 옥수드 홈 서포트 서비스 뿌르드 데버리 베네피스 인플로이먼 어시스턴스 페미리 바이든스 프로텍티브 서비스 어동 웰 하우딩 메디컬 리헤비리테이션 So in all of these examples, hopefully the take home message today will inspire you to think about examples of your own where the same people have been empowered in another thing. Now I'm about to show, I'm about to show a video clip from a documentary about the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and an impact on disabled people. It was called the right to be rescued. The power of the industry, how disabled people were left behind during Katrina. We're going to hear the story of two people. The air condition is very low. Usually they keep it around 50, 55 to reduce bacteria counts. Uh, hopefully the antibiotics will work. If they don't work, you'll just die. Aerial shot of flooded normals. It was when the levees broke and the water came that the problems really started occurring. The generators were in the basement, so they got flooded. And of course we had no power. Uh, as a result. So I went from a room that was like 55 degrees to a room that was like 115 within say three hours. The only way I could think of surviving the whole thing was to strip down to my underwear and just lay in the bed very still. I was on a gravity drip IV and I just laid there for five days and watched helicopters fly around the building. So we were the last probably the last hospital to be evacuated on day five. First responders were great. It's just that they came there five days later. <laughs> I feel lucky. I knew it was kind of bad. That's the first thing and I'm gonna say the second. Take her to the Superdome. They did not want to take her wheelchair or her physical assistant. She physically could not have gotten by without the help of someone and without her wheelchair. She couldn't, she couldn't have made it. A deserted street on a clear day. Storm passed, everything seemed okay. I called and she let out a huge sigh of relief. And we started talking and just kind of relaxing. Then all of a sudden she said that she heard something. She goes, wait, I hear something. And she goes, oh my God, water's coming in. And I could just hear this panic in her voice. And then all of a sudden, the phone line cut out. Underwater view, looking up at the sunlight. I tried calling on her cell phone. I tried all during the day, and I could not get through. Her physical assistant called here and said when she last left her, she was in water up to her neck and then he handed her her cell phone and her address book and said, call Pam, call the others, and tell them I'm dead. There's no reason for two of us to drown. An aerial view of ruined houses with the water level reaching the rooftop. Now, it's sadness, but for about three years it was anger. Um Believable. The message in this video, it's, it's really about the lack of response on the part of government and nonprofit. We've heard the same story over and over again. It happened during Hurricane Sandy when disabled people were not evacuated from nursing homes by the beach. 
that happened during COVID-19 when the fever people were the last one to be considered for ventilator. So the message here is about the right to be rescued. And we need to advocate for a new piece of legislation that's being proposed, real emergency access for aging and disability including, including for the Dastard Act. Mercy Roth will probably talk about this theater today. Meanwhile, I would love to hear from everyone in the audience. Have you seen examples of how people with disabilities have organized to provide their own emergency or climate aid? Yes or no? While you think about this and respond, I would like to argue that the message today should not just be about the right to be rescued, but about self-empowerment and autonomy through the creation of terror vibes. There's a fantastic author in the disability justice activist, Dia Dakshmi Pippavanda. She pointed out that terror collecting are one mechanism for creating collective action. We saw during COVID-19, the disabled people were swapping masks, providing ventilators, batteries. She talked about this movement being rooted in the disabled LGBTQ, brown and indigenous people of color. In small ways, the disabled people have been helping each other for a long time. That really looked those are the stereotype of the disabled people as passive recipient of aid rather than active contributor. I also would love to know, I see from the poll that it's about half and half. More, more people are saying no than gas. 53% saying no, 47% saying gas. It's both hopes for that half of you know of example, but also the that's an indication that we need to do more and have more disabled people feel that sense of autonomy. Now, that's the sort of a disability and emergency preparedness activist of color gave a great talk a few weeks ago through the John Hopkins Center on Disability. There's a new center there. Just the said, we can consider disability rights as this main thing, system of discrimination. But disability justice teaches us how to build rivers into the green the system. How can we dream? How can we dream beyond these systems here? I'm going to say an image here. In September of 2022, the United Nations Secretary General he called on the room to stop sleepwalking to the destruction of our planet through climate change. Then there's an image of a woman in a wheelchair with water almost up to her knees, carrying a bag in her lap, while a woman behind her is pushing the wheelchair. 80% of disabled people live in poor countries that don't have the resources to deal in the aftermath of a climate or other emergency. This means 
that disabled people cannot afford not to have autonomy or self-empowerment. And on another scene, who knows much about the logistics of providing care to disabled people? Who knows much about how to access equipment that disabled people need? Disabled people. Over 2.5 million people need electric devices that require electricity. Think about all the home care devices disabled people need. Power chain and scooter, CPAP, BPAP machine, ventilator, insulin pumps, refrigerators, the insulin and other medicine. Assistive communication devices. Bed ditch, cooling pain, cooling pain, or healing danger. So I believe, in addition to the right to be rescued, disabled people need to continue organizing and preparing before an emergency happens so that by the time when it does happen, disabled people are not only relying on the government or nonprofits for their own liberation. I believe government, civil society, and mainstream nonprofit, both in the climate change and emergency preparedness and response sector, can really learn from the example I share from Lebanon, Australia, and how disabled people have their initiative. We need to refrain disabled people as active leaders. Advocates, support providers, not just passive recipients of aid, and enhancing capacity through more tailored accessibility initiatives. In doing so, we can foster disability rights by mitigating the impact of climate emergency on disabled people. Now I'm going to wrap up with a powerful quote I'm going to share before opening up the question. Dear Lakshmi Prabhavan, the wrote a book called Killer Work, Dreaming the Disability Doctors about mutual aid networks that by disabled people. I will now share an excerpt from her book. They her, I am worried, but I also dream of a better future. Her quote begins, I have worried that as sick and disabled people, we will be the one abandoned when our city is not. I am dreaming the biggest disabled dream of my life. Dreaming not just of a revolutionary movement in which we are not abandoned, but a movement in which we lead the way. With all of our crazy adopted devices, loving kinship and commitment to each other, we will leave no one behind as we roll, limp, spin, sign, and move in a million way to co-creating the ecodonial living future. I am dreaming like my life depends on it because it does. So now I want to turn it over to the audience. I am curious to know more about you, 
how you identify what kind of example you have seen of disabled people organizing to provide their own emergency aid. And I'm also interested in knowing really what it would take to foster increased participation of disabled people in preparing for and responding to uh, the covering from emergency. Thank you. I see that someone mentioned in the comment that it was funding through FEMA to organize specialist team people. I know now they are more disability including specialists at FEMA, which are the great stuff. Cynthia mentioned collecting data sharing networks and proactively coming up with a plan for an emergency. Let me interesting this them ask yourself whether or not you have a plan. And if that plan is robust, if you identify as the same whether you need and how can we make sure the need are met. Then we made a great point in the chat about how every governmental body should have a wrap from a disability, from the population of disabled people to work with the government and work with non-profit. I absolutely agree. Disabled people need to have a seat at the table. I'm especially curious to hear from the 37, 38% of people who have seen extensive disabled people mobilizing in an emergency. I would love to hear these examples. I'm loving the discussion in the chat. Jennifer talked about trying to start on a program working with the disabled person and their family to build personalized support plan. That is great. And I'm not surprised that the county government doesn't see the need for this. We were taking it on piece by piece. She mentioned the news to have more conversation about emergency than unexpected and then facility training. I am so happy to hear that one person um, working on a maybe nonprofit, but if really on how the same people should have a bag pack in case of an emergency. That would mean great point that it's possible that the same people lost their trust in the system and running the pen on their system. I mentioned the survey of American earlier in my talk about how many of them have the assumption the first responder would come and save them. We're probably right that many disabled people may not have that assumption. But at the same time, I don't know how prepared disabled people are. Some of them are, I'm sure, but others or not, or maybe the others who don't feel that sense of empowerment, who don't have autonomy, and they don't believe that they could. 
I really don't have anybody to further this conversation. The some of you, but I've shared to them by in some way we preach into the masses, but for others it might be inspiring, uh, might spark new dialogue. has been made a great point about centering the safety and the dignity of disabled people to make sure PCA's personal care system and home care workers are classified as essential workers. I really wanted to emphasize, you know, this afternoon, after this, we're going to be hearing from Marcy Rock. Now, Marcy was instrumental in really pushing devastation, two pieces of devastation. They've not been passed yet, I don't believe, but maybe we can help her pass this. And one of them is making sure that the same American and Medicaid who are displaced to another state because of an emergency, would still be able to continue receiving their benefits. I mean, we have some nice international policy, including disabled people. You know, the United Nations Convention on the Vice people with disability Article 11 specifically, but sometimes it's not enough. The same people need to mobilize on their own. The emergency responders have made so many mistakes not knowing how to accommodate people. We need to uh, Listen and learn and have the disabled people at the table. Sometimes the disabled people in that community are unnecessarily separated from family members and put into special need shelters despite not needing any medical care just because, for example, they might be in a wheelchair. We have a couple of questions that have been posted in the Q&A box. Um, the first is, what is the best way to provide individuals with disabilities with a seat at the table during planning efforts? Are there organizations we can reach out to that can advocate for those with a disability or is it a matter of connecting with multiple organizations? There are some wonderful comments I want to mention here. Um, Kim Davis mentioned that there are deaf and hard of hearing people in multiple states that have taken up what they call SALT, Immunity Emergency Response Training, and to create an emergency shelter at a deaf club. And if you want, you want to know if there are any other state, or any other disabled population with sort training. So I wrote a paper looking at an assessment of training needs. And I have a table with a list of all the training I could find at the time. So I think that might be a great thing to start. And now um, in Northern California, too, that there's an initiative to train American Sign Language interpreters to do specialized, what they call it, the R.I., the Dastor Relief Interpreting. I was thinking again about the quote that I said about, you know, living, dreaming, you know, the biggest disabled dream of my life, a revolutionary movement. 
And I think that's what we need to, I believe that's what we need. In this week, this whole week, it's part of this movement. And I really hope that um, the conversation won't end today, but keep reverberating.